-hmm. For me, it was as much a matter of need as calling. Um, I found it very, very easy to be very uh, intense about my faith and about witness for Jesus and about, you know, living uh, biblically at times and other times very stumbled or tempted to fall back into my old life. Just at that point, I just wanted to give myself to God. I, that's all I could think of. And the, the only way I thought of doing it was to become a part of these people that seemed to love the Lord so much. And um, even though I didn't understand what they did or what the community was, I felt that's what I needed in my life. I really did see my need for, you know, to, to be with stronger Christians. And I really sensed that through Resban and the magazine through Cornerstone that that there was a depth in in these people's lives that um, that I needed or somehow desired to want to be a part of my life. Just uh, their commitment to the poor, which was obvious, and and uh, but I certainly didn't know what I was getting into. Hello, Jesus loves you. May I help you? Jesus People USA is a Christian community um, consisting of about 450 people that um, live here communally, um, pool their finances, and have basically caught a vision for inner city missions. Other religions include the poor, but they're not sought after. And Jesus put a lot of emphasis on the poor, not only the economically poor, but those of us who who were kind of disenfranchised with the world, poor in our uh, in our position in the world, and 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 Christianity reaches out to those people and says, "You're important. You're you're you have value." Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book uh, *The Cost of Discipleship*, says, "The way which the Son of God trod on the earth, and the way which we too." must tread as citizens of two worlds on the razor edge between this world and the kingdom of heaven could hardly be a broad way. The narrow way is bound to be right. The disciples of Jesus must not fondly imagine that they can simply run away from the world and huddle together in a little band. And, and that's, I think, what we consider ourselves and, and we feel that Christians could could consider themselves as citizens of two worlds. Yes, we live on this world, but then we are also members of the kingdom of God. This place has evolved to be what it is, and you have to understand a little bit of the history to understand what it is. Um, right now, at the present moment, it's a Christian community of about 400 people, including children, about 275 adults. It started out uh, back in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, back in 1969-70. There was a flower, uh, flyer put in my um, mailbox about this Jesus festival that was going to be coming on, this you know uh, rally type of thing with all these bands out in this open field near Antioch, Illinois, very close to where we are right now. And I convinced a friend to go with me, and we went, and there was this one of the groups that were there was this large group of people that had this old school bus painted uh, the believers all over it and they all had long hair and this but they were really praising the lord and they were really really dedicated witnesses and that was the jesus people in milwaukee and uh i just i felt at home it's an offshoot of that milwaukee uh -huh. ministry which um it's it's set, went off into different evangelistic areas uh, we were the only group that really stuck and stayed together, I think, through it all, through all the years. We, we called ourselves Jesus People USA Traveling Team, and we just took off on a bus 
and started traveling all over the country. We settled in Chicago and it was really at that point that we began to gain the consciousness of ourselves as a community and we also began to grow. Well, I'm involved in Res Band. Res, uh, Resurrection, uh, people call us Res for so many years, we just decided to, you know, save cost on ink and we're talking eventually it'll, it'll get down to R, and, you know. <laughs> but anyway, the band was started in December, about the 12th of December, as a matter of fact, 71. The pastors in the, lead, in, in the fellowship believed, as I, did, as I came to, that the Lord actually wanted to raise up a band that would witness lyrically, uh, in a very biblical way, dealing with topics and issues, as well as straight ahead gospel kind of witness, testimonies of how our lives have been changed, uh, with a style of music that would relate to the kids on the street. began to play and do concerts and we're working now on our 10th album and you know it's been 18 years and we've been all over the world. We evangelized through the Res Band still after all these years. We um, evangelize you know on the streets talking to people. The whole thing with evangelism is is God hasn't called us to be Christians and to just sit down and to just read our Bibles and that's that's our whole thing. He's told us to get involved. He's told us that we are to go out and be examples, to be witnesses. A few kids that, that have, or play in our yard and stuff like that, me personally, I, I brought to the Lord one of them. And so, I mean, I really think this is, and I witnessed to a couple other kids. And I mean, I think the Lord just really uses the kids know to witness to other kids. I generally carry a pouch full of tracks to hand out. Some of them, like one specific track has my testimony in it and stuff of just the different things I was involved in and all that. Because I've come to learn that the testimony is an important part of our witness and our um, example because it's, it's truth that we personally know. And you know, I haven't seen glorious hundreds come to the Lord or anything, but I know that I'm doing my part in the brothers and sisters who go with me. And, um, you know, I know that God sees that and I know that he's happy. With what makes a pers person a Christian is if they really do follow Christ and if they do really love him and worship him. You're not a Christian just because your mom and dad are Christians or you go to church every day. You have to accept Jesus personally. It's neither more nor less than having a personal living relationship with Jesus Christ and what that relationship consists of is a realization that on the cross Christ in effect paid the price, paid the penalty for my personal wrongdoing, my personal sin as well as all man's sin but for me it has to be a personal choice. It's not, a, it's not an intellectual decision, at least not only one. It, it, it has to be that too, but it ultimately has to be a matter of will. We feel that, that as Christians we need one another, and we feel very strongly that, you know, a person who comes here you know, needs to be accountable to somebody, it needs to have someone that they're accountable to, needs um, you know, firm foundation in the Lord. You know, many times they need counseling and, you know, just a lot of love. Someone comes here, they're assigned an older person who's been a member of the community for, for, for some time, who's a responsible um, older member who can uh, you know, help disciple somebody, who can uh, be a friend to them, who can uh, uh, have some spiritual input into their lives with reading and praying together and, and counseling. I know that the Lord called me here and I know that this is where I need to stay because I know today as I just look at what's happened with me today the Lord has worked with me, He's challenged me and He does every day and I think without that challenge I wouldn't do so well. It would be easy for me to fall back into sins or some of the old ways. 
We have, you know, people who are from wealthy families, people who are from poor families, people who have no family at all, um, people from broken families, people from Christian or stable families. Um, I think one thing that, that binds most of us together is, is just a need for one another. We're charismatic, we're Pentecostal, but really we're evangelical who happen to be charismatic and Pentecostal. We, we don't swing from the rafters. Uh, you will rarely hear anybody praying in tongues or singing or, you know, people don't get up and run around the church and go nuts. But there's a lot of joy. We're more reserved than people would expect us to be in our Sunday services. You ever wonder why in the world we do some of the things we do in this fellowship? Why as Christians we ought to be doing evil on a number of levels? At the point of human need and human hurt. This is Psalm 82. We will hopefully throw the ring in your mind. Those really are the three main concerns that we're about anymore. Evangelism is still very important. Discipling, really helping people to grow in their own maturity, grow in their own faith, um, and, and reaching out to, to meet people's needs, whether they be you know, material needs or spiritual. We can reach out to the poor, and it's just like if we live somewhere else, like who are, like in the suburbs or something, we couldn't reach out as much. We never even intended ever to feed 350 people, or 300, 350 people off the streets every day. It just happened. You know, someone would be talking to some guy and, you know, about the Lord and find out, oh, this guy hasn't eaten in two days or, or something. And the guy says, hey, come home, you know, have dinner with me. Before you knew it, we had over 100 people coming home and having dinner with us, and we thought, well, maybe this is what God wants. One time we used to feed everybody here in the same room, both the poor and ourselves alike. But because it started growing, uh, we realized that we couldn't feed ourselves and the poor at the same time because there's just not enough space. So we had to separate the two. We eat our meal at 5 in the evening and the poor eat at 2.30, from 2.30 to 3.30. We give them all our leftover foods from, uh, from what we've eaten, but we also make them special meals as well. And we, we also depend on, on donations. So. Uh, in whatever way, whatever way the food comes, we, we get it, whether we buy it or whether it's given in donations. And we have a lot of cooks who work hard to, to make something uh, really nice for the dinner guests. We put certain cooks in charge of uh, the dinner guest meals, and uh, certain other cooks are in charge of uh, cooking our ministry meals. And um, we have, we, uh, it's a pretty small kitchen for the, the size of uh, work that we're doing, but we're able to do all the things that are needed. They give food away. They they uh give, give you tea when you ain't got none and coffee and everything. Christians tend to react to the poor as undeserving, forgetting that uh, they themselves are undeserving. That's the whole message of the cross: is that we don't we do not deserve what we are given. The meaning of grace literally is unmerited favor. And uh, somehow, in a spirit of self-righteousness, American Christians have decided that there are certain segments of the poor that because they drink or use drugs or whatever, don't deserve our help. And I can't think of a more unbiblical theology. It's one thing to be able to house them or clothe them or help feed them on an emergency basis but tr the truth of the matter is in order to help them as far as a long on a long-term basis you have to have some sort of basis for that and a lot of times those those changes have to come come about on a political spectrum uptown is a ghetto which 
historically has been predominantly made up of Appalachian whites and more recently of Asian immigrants. A process of uh, gentrification has begun and what they decided to do was buy up block after block of property. Uh, some buildings vacant and some buildings with poor families and individuals in it, buy those buildings, kick those people out, and uh, renovate the buildings and then jack the rent up to about three times its original worth. We have tried to fight as best we could, but it's been largely a losing battle, to tell the truth, because uh, the opposition, so to speak, has a very uh, very well mapped out approach. As the housing crisis in this neighborhood has sort of risen dramatically because of gentrification and things like that, uh, there is less housing for people that is affordable. I think it's good because downstairs in our, lo in our dining room, we have um, people that who are homeless and they come almost every night. Last winter, as a result of a great amount of people uh, needing more and more people needing housing, we opened up our overnight warming center type housing where we just opened up the dining room for the women and children. Most shelters, the warming center type or the winter type closed down, so then all of a sudden there's these women with no place to go. So we decided to remain open because of the need. We still housed, uh, you know, as we speak, about 25 to 35 women. People who are really in need of a place to stay, they're pretty much free to come in and you know, bunk out for the night. We usually open the doors for them to come in around 9 o'clock. We let um, women with children come in around 8.30, and then um, and we try and get them all settled down, try to get the lights off, both sets of lights off by 10.30, and we try to get everything all quieted down. And then by 6 o'clock in the morning, we wake them up, and we try to get them out and on their way by 7.30, because we have, we have families coming in who live here. They come down for breakfast, and we need to get the place turned into a dining room again. We're making the most of our stay here at this Jesus People, and we're enjoying the, the help around here, and they are very good in keeping law and order around here. I've been here uh, five days. I'm a battered, battered wife and um, they, I was hard to place because I left my husband before and we were in other shelters and so it's difficult to place you once you've been in the system. I have one child left at home and um, everything's going better. <laughs> The way we have to deal with one another to live in this kind of a situation forces us to develop relationships that have depth. You know, you have to continually face yourself. There's no way out. You know, you just can't go in a room and hide and think, well, I'm just going to sit here until I'm done being mad, you know, for 12 hours because there's no place to hide. I have very competent marital counselors living all around me. You know, I mean, I, I don't have to go very far to get that. And, and it shows. I mean, it's like my, my marriage shows that input. The single people don't date. We see that relationship between men and women is very serious and not something that's lightly played with. And I do not believe that God wants us to seek wives or to seek husbands, to, but to seek Him. And in doing so, to trust that He knows our needs and He will fulfill them. We both liked each other. We're praying about each other. So at that time, we have a member, um, well, a council of about 10 pastors where they have council meetings. They talk about bills, the store, relationships. Um, maybe some people are having problems and they're thinking what kind of things do we need to counsel them in. So it's just a, a variety of things they talk about in meetings. Well, they brought it up one day and said, well, you know, Don and James like each other. How do we feel about them? How's their walk with the Lord? And, you know, and they all agreed upon it. You can't so. live an independent life in community. So it's, it's not possible by definition. It doesn't happen. Whether you think you can or want to makes no difference. Uh, when there's a bad marriage in community, 
that, that trauma ripples out and affects all kinds of people. We basically were engaged for about a year. And uh, after that, we got, well, it was probably more like 15 months. So after that, we got married. We've been married for six months. It would be horribly irresponsible if we just sat back and let everybody who, at a whim, wanted to get married, get married. Those who, who are in uh, pastoral roles within the community all meet together uh, at least once a week and spend quite a few hours talking and praying and trying to help cover the major decisions that the community makes as a whole and, and um, really checking and balancing uh, one another. There's a great deal of accountability between us. We are uh, pretty much totally self-supporting. Only about less than 10% of our total income comes from donations. 90% uh, is, is a result of these uh, businesses that we own and operate. The council and those business heads sit down together and that's where we sort of interface the nuts and bolts, the business concerns. Our painting company started out years and years ago as an offshoot, a little bit of our moving company. People were being evicted in the neighborhood and uh, asking us to move them. And eventually some, um, some folks were willing to pay to have us move them. And, and once they were in, they were willing to pay for us to paint their apartments, to paint their homes. and. And it just kind of, Lord, just laid it there for us to do as a, as a business to um, help contribute to supporting the ministry. There's uh, painting, moving, roofing. design, which is, uh, they make uh, custom bookshelves and different things like that, home entertainment units, um, like front roofing supply. Born Again Designs, I believe that's it. We started our mail order catalog, a mail order catalog in October of 1987 with hopes to generate some money to help support Cornerstone Magazine. We design clothing and we make it and dye it and sell it basically. Started working on Cornerstone Magazine which really originated in the back of a bus. <laughs> that was where we first started putting it together. It was what we used to go out street witnessing. And we wanted it to have enough in it so a person looking at it would really understand what it was to be a Christian and how they could become a Christian and how they could live a Christian life. But also, you know, we always considered ourselves a little more on the cutting edge because we we always tackled controversial issues. I think the magazine's vision is to be a voice for people that don't have a voice in the evangelical world. Uh, our roots came out of the Jesus movement itself, and there are large numbers of Jesus people that have never really re-entered the mainstream churches because they feel alienated from them. Uh, Cornerstone I believe provides a voice for those people and it provides an expression of our worldview as well. I think as we've grown as a magazine we're even more so um, just always digging up the most controversial issue. I mean not just to be contentious but because we want Christians to be able to face, have to face things in the world and, and we want to challenge Christians to do to face these things themselves personally and do something about them with their lives. One of our members has just written a lovely poem to dedicate <laughs> our pep rally tonight. Isn't that special? <laughs> it goes like this. You can have lots of money, 
you can get lots of fame. But without the Lord, your best is quite a shame. Isn't that special? That's evolved into a tradition now, um, the pep rally. We started out with just a general meeting to let everybody know what's going on at the festival and you know what their assignments are and, and kind of just get everybody excited about it because it is like a community project. The festival is probably the only um, major outreach where everybody visibly are involved all one time as one project. We basically transplant everything from Chicago to Waukegan or Gray's Lake for four or five days, maybe a week. When we first start, st started talking about uh, doing a festival, just to do something we ourselves would enjoy going to. You know, we've been to all the different festivals around the country, and uh, I just think like they always play good rock music in the afternoons, and the speakers are always sometimes contradictory, and topics they cover was really scattered. We said, why don't we give you five to seven one-hour sessions one topic and you can go for it and when somebody comes to the festival over four days they'll sit through five to seven one-hour sessions on an issue and when you first begin to study and you first begin to find out that you can actually take principles from god's word and learn to apply them in situations that the bible may not directly in, uh, address that will not only make you built up but it will also build up our relationship and we will be responsive to one another. It's a golden law. Consumerism is not synonymous with happiness. And what we as Christians need to rediscover, that it's in losing life, not in seeking life, that we're going to find out where the real action is and where the real good times are. So why settle for more when we can have the best? for us to be around people who are like us and you know like where we're from there's not always a lot of Christian people that we can relate to and here we always know that there's going to be you know people that are into the same sort of thing and also have Jesus in common. We knew it would be a real good Christian family environment. I pastor a church and uh, we don't get away as together as a family too often so we've been planning this all winter. Keegan, Illinois. I'm at Corn Cornerstone 1989 here, skating. I came for skating. Most of all, I love Jesus. Uh, I'm a Christian. Um, I'm here with my friend Jay. He's skating too, and uh, we're just having fun. It's really cool. The bands out here are really hot and everything like that. Food's good.
going to the festival is really fun. I like that a lot, and that's one of my favorite things. Um, there's lots of kids here that I can play with, and that's that's uh, that's one of my favorite things. I have good friends here, good Christian friends, and they they can be an example for me, and then I can be an example for the younger kids. They can look up to us. I think it's an asset to grow up in a community like it is to grow up in a large family because I think my children have, are learning, you know, learning to share. There's a lot of hurts and yeah, uh -huh. unpleasant things too in this world that we can't just erase and make them go away and, you know, want to live in a nice place where you don't have to see these things. So they make our, I think they make our children a little aware too that, you know, there are things in the world that, um, and just maybe just to let them grow up with a little more compassion and a desire in their hearts, hopefully anyway, to want to help these people also. a Christian school where we learn a lot where we learn a lot of things we had felt called to stay in Chicago to to really minister here but we did not feel like our children could go to public schools here particularly the areas in Chicago that we really wanted to minister in the really poor the really ghetto areas uh, just from sheer, um, well, there's many things wrong with the schools here in Chicago, of course. There's uh, gang problems, drug problems, but the biggest concern is the academics are so low. That's just how it started. With two children, and then, of course, more children came, and it, it has progressed now to we have about 100 school-age children, and we have about 30 teachers. They have to be intelligent. They have to really know, be able to know their material and teach it well and have that innate intelligence to go with it. But really, they're just as important, they have to really like kids and be real tolerant and just be the kind of person that make, you know, makes kids comfortable, makes a classroom a real learning place. We study about the Lord, and we also study about math, and history and English. We started out with English and then we did math, then we did Bible and and science and history. Um, and and then later on like um, since it's in the summer we, we we just mainly go out and do fun things, sort of like go to restaurants and go to the park and things. I'm very concerned as a parent and as a teacher and as an older member of this community that we really teach our kids why we're here, what we're doing. And if they agree, if they agree to join us in this as they become adults and make their very own decision, I'll be blessed. But I want them to make it not just because, well, my parents lived here and I just live here. Sometimes I, I, just, I just don't like it and I think, you know what? If I ever get a chance, I'm going to move out of this ministry. But then sometimes I think, I say to myself, you know what? Man, if I get a chance, I'm going to stay here forever as long, my whole life. I just want, I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. I'm going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Well, I want to go to college to be a journalist. And um, my friend Heather, she wants to go to college to be an artist. But, um... I'm not really decided yet. I do want to go to college, but I also want to stay here. Yeah. This is definitely the Lord's will at work. And everything that I know about this ministry tells me that it's the Lord put all this together because way back in the early 70s, they started from absolutely nothing. All this has been given to them by the Lord's will as, as they grew up. God determined that things would go and they, they've gone. You know, God determined thing would thing would work. This community would happen and, and continue and and prosper in in various levels, not financially, that's for sure, but at least enough to stay afloat. Well, that's been for 
it's it's going to be what it'll be 18 years or 19 years this uh, this coming up on 19 years um, that's that's this that's the simple form uh, the longer more practical down to earth answer there are a lot of people a real core of people i don't know how big that core is maybe a third of the community maybe a half i don't maybe 60% of the community i don't know of the community who sacrifice every day in in a lot of ways to live out what they believe is god's calling and what is their desire in life and that's to live together and to serve god in this way <laughs>